Well, good morning. If you're in the East Coast of the United States, good evening, good night, late night, good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. We're going to be talking about <clears throat> a medication for diabetes called empagliflozin. It's, um, n there's not a lot of people that, um, that are familiar with it, but it's one of the new blockbuster drugs for diabetes. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to be talking about the use with uh, kidney failure. Now, one of the things before we get started, uh, we're not going to be covering too much about the mechanism. And I expect um, as you start looking at this, one of the questions that might be coming up would be, well, how does this medicine actually work? Um, what we're going to be talking about is uh, empagliflozin and kidney failure. In other words, very significant uh, damage to the kidneys associated with diabetes. One of the things that people don't know, and we covered uh, in a short content a couple of weeks ago, is that uh, kidney failure is, or kidney damage is far more common even in um, prediabetes than most doctors understand. And that's because one of the things that first happens is um, as you start getting injury to those baroreceptors, those pressure receptors in the kidneys, you start increasing the uh, the pressure. You start the kidney starts the mechanism starts saying let's re let's correct this problem, and sometimes they overcorrect. So you think, oh my goodness, is, this person has a really good kidney function or really good flow through the kidneys, when in fact it's beginning to suffer due to diabetes. Before we get into the introduction for the uh, video today, I'm going to talk just a second about the mechanism for uh, the gliflozins, now, or the SGLT2 uh, inhibitors. And, and it helps to break down the, the, the name, the term. SG stands for sodium or salt, glucose. So uh, it's a glu sodium glucose transport uh, in, in, inhibitor. So well, what, is, what is that all about? So here's what happens. The, the kidneys are basically filters. Each kidney has about a million filters in it, and those filters um, will spill glucose, especially as glucose starts getting higher and higher in our blood. Well, it also had, the, the kidneys also have some uh, high pressure uh, areas, they have some ways to filter and pull that glucose back into the blood. So somebody got some really smart ideas and realized, you know what, if we could inhibit that process of pulling glucose back into the blood, then we could just set up a system where as the blood sugar got too high, the kidney would just spill that sugar out. And guess what? That's exactly what the SGLT2s do. Now, <clears throat> so if you think about that, that gives you a couple of, com of thoughts about, well, you know what? what uh, somebody just asked on the, I think it was, um, oh gosh, it was Bobby Ocampo asked before the show even started, is there any research on empagliflozin and hypoglycemia? Well, Absolutely. And the uh, empagliflozin and the other gliflozins are all extremely low risk for hypoglycemia. And why? Because of that mechanism. Once you understand that mechanism, you can understand why. These are very effective drugs for um, diabetes, but uh, unlike insulin, which is a huge risk for hypoglycemia, there's little to no risk for empagliflozin. So um, one of the things we're going to be talking about today is, well, what about kidney disease? Somebody who's, who's got recognized kidney disease, um, should they take it? Because this functions using the kidney. Well, if, it turns out if you look at the instructions on the, uh, on the medications, they'll say you should not take it or you should be concerned about taking it if you have uh, kidney failure. Well, when you look a little bit deeper, you find a very, very different picture. And that's what we'll be talking about today in our long form content. 
short form content, short topic, uh, a medication called bempidoic acid. You know, it adds another wrinkle to the story about cholesterol, LDL, statins. Bempidoic acid was originally built, developed to uh, add to um, helping people who have risk despite having statin therapy. One of the things they began to wonder is, well, what about all those people that really can't take statins? It's a great question, and we'll actually cover that today. It turns out it helps. The other thing that that brings up is, well, wait a minute. If this is something that just decreases uh, LDL, how is it helping with cardiovascular disease? Well, we'll see the rest of the picture on that as well. But before we get into those, let's, let me go ahead and uh, give us the rest of the introduction. If you haven't been to our channel before, our channel is all about helping people understand and uh, prevent the things that kill and disable most of us. When it's mostly heart attack, stroke, cardiovascular disease, uh, dementia. And once you boil all those down, it turns out that most of them have a very, very common single risk factor. And that is the inability to metabolize carbs in a healthy way prediabetes, diabetes, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, all the same thing. So as we get, um, you, you get deeper into our channel, we've got, gosh, over a thousand videos now, almost all about those, those items. We do cover some other items in uh, general preventive medicine, like prevention of death from colon cancer, things like that. Um, let me go back in and uncover there we go okay so <clears throat> here's some other topics that we've covered recently on the show lean mass hyper responder studies you know there's so much argument and debate about ldl quote bad cholesterol and it's interesting to note that some people when they take when they drop their carbs and they think well i'm going on a healthy low carb diet and my cholesterol should really drop in, in fact, it does the absolute opposite thing. It goes up and it goes way up. There's a lot of research going on in that area. We had a fellow named um, Dave Feldman on who's doing a lot of that about a year ago and talked about just this issue. So we, we went into a lot more detail on it last week. Intermittent fasting. That's a very, very popular way of managing your weight. Um, and one of the questions is, what is intermittent fasting? How do you define it? Uh, what does it do? So we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Um, calcium, as we said, we sometimes uh, deal with things that are not uh, specific to cardiovascular disease, and calcium is one of them. If you're in your uh, 20s and 30s and you have a high calcium level, that's not such a big deal. But if you're in your 50s and 60s and you have a borderline, even a borderline high calcium, you need to be aware that's often a sign of hyperparathyroidism or even a parathyroid gland tumor. These things can be dealt with. They're not like, you know, like a scary cancer, malignant cancer, but there's something you need to deal with. If you don't, you can end up with something very similar to lockjaw with uh, cramps uh, in your muscles that you just can't get over. Now, when you hear that we've got over a thousand, maybe 1400 videos, it sounds like, gosh, how, am I, how would I ever learn all of that? I could, that's just too much stuff. We've got uh, core courses, uh, uh, three simple core courses that are a little bit less than two hours each. With those three courses, you can learn more about what kills people and disables them and what's more likely to kill or disable you than anything else. You can learn more about that than your doctor knows. And that's a good thing because, and sometimes that's a little bit of a low bar, you know, Hop, folks at Hopkins at first and now Mayo and other folks have demonstrated that your typical doctor, two thirds of doctors, primary care, family medicine, internal medicine, cardio, even cardiology, don't know how to diagnose prediabetes, let alone manage it. So 
We've got a course specifically on insulin resistance, prediabetes, how to diagnose it, what to do in terms of managing it. Another big error that uh, docs make over and over again is how to evaluate plaque. You know, you look at Big Russ, Tim Russert, a uh, very, very well-known guy, but also the poster boy for, hey, I passed my stress test. I was worried about heart attack, so I was good, right? And then he died from a heart attack. So that's not the best way. Stress test is not. And plaque, the plaque evaluation course and the book help you get exactly to where you need to be. <clears throat> One of the big questions about uh, what really causes heart attack and stroke is, is it LDL? Is it cholesterol or is it something else? And the real short uh, answer is it's something else. It's cardiovascular inflammation. And if you think most docs don't under, doctors don't understand prediabetes, uh, just start asking them about cardiovascular inflammation. Even fewer docs understand that. If you're a, um, if you're a YouTuber, uh, that's where we started our content. That's our home base, but we've begun to spread out. We have uh, information on locals, on Rumble, uh, you can even join our uh, YouTube channel if you're a YouTuber. Help us get this information out and save lives all over the world. Uh, I mentioned a few minutes ago that stress test is not the way to evaluate your heart attack and stroke risk. Um, if you're more of a book person, we have a book which covers exactly that. How do you measure your heart attack and stroke risk. It's called Prevention Myths. Why a stress test can't tell you uh, whether you're gonna have a heart attack. Um, Jesus has been doing a lot of work on getting our pilot program set up for Medicare. We put out a couple of emails letting folks know we're starting to get into that space. And here's why, a couple of reasons. The biggest one being uh, under our direct pay model, we're expensive. You know, it's a lot of money out, you know, out of pocket to pay to see us. Um, and we've been working for a couple of years on how to develop this so that we could see patients with just a copay and accept Medicare. We are al almost there. We're actually seeing Medicare patients as uh, we speak. I've got a couple of Medicare patients that I'll be seeing today. So if you're interested in that, um, give us a call. Uh, Rafi, if you'll put up the number and email for, uh, for Michelle and the group, that'll help folks understand how to reach us. There you go. PrevMedHealth.com or 859-721-1414. Now, a lot of you have said, look, I, um, I really want my own doc to do this. I want to see my own doc, but my doc just doesn't understand this. Is there something you can do to, uh, if I could motivate my doc to learn this, um, to get involved. And we did that. We've developed a whole uh, YouTube channel and a whole website. Uh, it's based on information that I developed when I was the chief science officer for a large uh, Medicare Advantage company called uh, Physician Partners. And basically what we, my job was, was to teach docs how to do prevention how to uh, do well in a prevention type of insurance environment like Medicare Advantage. So if you'd like to get your doc involved, refer him or her to prevmednetwork.com or youtube.com at prevmednetwork. Now, <clears throat> we mentioned that new cholesterol medication, bimpedoic acid. This came out in New England Journal just well, what today is the what the 21st, so we're talking about three weeks ago. And basically, what it said is this stuff is actually decreasing heart attacks. Now, if you watch our channel, most folks watching our channel really don't think that decreasing uh, LDL, quote, bad cholesterol, is going to impact heart attacks. So, if you think that, how do you describe? Um, what we're getting ready to talk about. So first of all, this was a randomized clinical trial. They used bimpedoic acid. And bimpedo the, the mechanism, by the way, for bimpedoic acid is to decrease cholesterol production by the liver in a way that's different, a different mechanism from the way that statins do it. Um, 
as I said, it was originally developed to to maybe add more impact for um, for folks that were still at risk, even though they thought they had lowered their their LDL significantly. It was a randomized clinical trial, so you know a very very powerful study design. Great numbers, thirteen thousand nine hundred and seventy. Now, this was not specifically patients that were already on statins, but they felt their their treatment was inadequate. This is a different group. This is people who were statin intolerant. So that is a really big deal, especially among uh, a lot of patients that uh, have come to see us. We've seen many, many people with statin intolerance. The, uh, of those 13,970 statin intolerant patients, 6,978 were assigned to the bimpedoic acid group. Um, uh, oh, excuse me, no, I got that number wrong. 13,970 were assigned to the BA group and 6,708 were assigned to the placebo. Patients were followed for 60 months looking for cardiovascular events. So a five-year study and here's what they found. Patients uh, on bimpedoic acid had a 0 0.7, uh, 0 0.87 hazard ratio. In other words, they were significantly less likely to have a cardio cardiovascular event, um, including a non-fatal heart attack. There was a reduction of up to 22.2% in C-reactive protein. So maybe the other shoe just dropped for those of you who are saying, I don't think LDL is going to do that, bad cholesterol. Uh, it's more of a cardiovascular inflammation thing. So you see what's what this is showing. Um, yes, we use statins as well. And no, we don't think that uh, most of the statin impact on heart attack and stroke is due to lowering LDL. We think it has to do with cardiovascular inflammation. So if you have another drug like bimpedoic acid and it helps with cardiovascular disease, does it also have one of those uh, pleiotropic mechanisms? Does it also decrease cardiovascular inflammation? Well, that's what this uh, clinical trial showed. It does that as well. So like the statins, yes, it decreases uh, in um, LDL, but it also decreases inflammation. The BA group also showed higher risk of developing gout and bilstone. So again, as with any medication, uh, you know, you got your benefits and you got your risks. Now, for those of you who are, uh, who are big pharma haters or always suspicious of big pharma, yes, this study was funded by, uh, big pharma. Now let's talk about, um, empagliflozin and kidney disease as soon as um, Rafi gives us the water ball. So uh, yeah, let's go to the long term, uh, long form content for today. And thank you, Dr. Brewer, and thank thank you everyone who is joining us and seeing the show what, right now. Uh, we we did discuss that probably the topic was not going to be uh, too attractive to most folks just because uh, many people don't know exactly what impact liflozin is about. And even some doctors don't even know SGLT2s and they're still prescribing other medications, older medications. Uh, however, we thought that this article was worth covering just because uh, it provides a new look, a new view of what the research is showing every day. So as Dr. Brewer mentioned, if you go to the label of this SGLT2 specific drug, uh, you will find that it says that it is not advised to be taken by people with chronic kidney disease. And the reality is probably that advice comes from the idea that it wasn't uh, or it hasn't been studied until now. So if, if 
one drug, we don't know what it can do on certain specific populations, such as people with uh, hep, uh, liver disease or kidney disease, they're not going to advise to take it until they have the evidence. And this is what we're showing right now. So the effects of empagliflozin in patients with chronic kidney disease who are at risk for disease progression are not well understood. That's why it wasn't recommended uh, even last year now. And the impact kidney study is a big study that is conducted as a randomized placebo controlled trial. And it evaluated the effects of the treatment of empagliflozin on kidney disease and cardiovascular outcomes. The, the C, CBOT trials that we have been seeing lately because uh, researchers have found that it's important to understand not only the basic mechanisms of the drug, but the impact that it has on cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular death. So uh, it will, I can yeah, interrupt. The, you mentioned the CVOT trials. What that stands for is cardiovascular outcome trials. And the first big CVOT trials in this space were also on empagliflozin. and they were the Impareg trials. And what they showed was significant decrease in cardiovascular outcomes, uh, disease, uh, cardiovascular disease associated with people taking empagliflozin. So it was a big deal. And, and that's the, the change of, of mentality where you're not just looking to decrease one biomarker. You're not looking just to decrease LDL. You are trying to find out if decreasing a biomarker, it's really going to have an impact on your overall mortality. So uh, the majority of people with chronic kidney disease have low levels of uh, uh, albuminuria and do not have diabetes. So even though many people with chronic kidney disease are being affected because they have diabetes, we mentioned that at the beginning, there is a phase where you won't see that damage to the kidney until it's too late. So the results of a pre-specified group uh, supergroup analysis from this trial and other trials uh, that involve dapagliflozin in patients with chronic kidney disease and albuminuria, even without diabetes, they reported that uh, in people with filtration rates below 30 is not that clear. So that brings me to uh, let you know that there are other SGLT2s such as dapagliflozin, and they have tried to understand how those uh, how that how that specific SGLT2 inhibitor works on current kidney disease, but they studied that on folks who had a filtration rate above 40. So when you talk about filtration rates about 40, 50, 60, that's kidney disease that is still manageable. But people who has kidney disease below 30, below 20, below 15, they are a higher risk of requiring dialysis. And that's what we want to know, how these medications impact on that setting. Are they more toxic or they can improve the kidney function? So in this study, they enrolled folks with uh, filtration, filtration rates from uh, down, up, uh, down to 20 or more uh, uh, filtration rates. Um, so in this population, they found out that empagliflozin can decrease the risk of uh, cardiovascular disease by 28% when compared to placebo. The rate of hospitalizations from any cause was even lower than that. And that leads us to the point to, to know that the medication is working. When you compare that to placebo, that's the, that's the, the standard to understand this. So the, you know, if you're <clears throat> one of the key things when you're an epidemiologist is go straight, you know, you can go to the intro and you can go to some of the summary, the abstract, but if you know already a little bit about the importance of the, uh, of the item and you don't need to read that part, uh, many of us go straight to the images and these images are very, very clear. For those patients, this is a randomized clinical trial, and for those patients that were taking gliflozin, empagliflozin, they were less likely to go into the hospital, less likely to have heart attack or, or other cardiovascular events. These are very, very powerful images. You don't need a whole lot of science background <clears throat> to be able to, to interpret that. 
So I think one of the things that we're likely to see soon is a change on that um, that indication about being careful about taking uh, empagliflozin if you have kidney disease. Yeah, and this is another huge component because we know that SGLT2s are used with, for people with diabetes. But in this research, they show that it can improve the kidney function, even in those folks who do not have diabetes or who are not diagnosed with diabetes. However, I will, I will say, if, if they're really sure that they don't have diabetes, right? Because you know, yeah, exactly right. You know, there's I, uh, diabetes is just so overwhelmingly underdiagnosed. And I think that's, that's exactly what this is saying. Uh, even in all those people who quote, didn't have a diagnosis of diabetes, but we knew they had it. And, and that's likely to be one of the root causes of the kidney disease. And that's why this works. Yeah. So, uh, one important thing to, to mention, there were not significant differences, uh, when we talk about hospitalization for heart failure or death from cardiovascular diseases, or deaths from any other relate, unrelated cause, which means that, that the impact and the benefit, even if it is present, it's still limited. Here's another thing to remember and think about. <clears throat> and it's, it's that concept, and we've, I've covered that in a couple of videos. People like to go to the bottom line and they like to say, well, if it didn't decrease death rate, overall, then why take it? Well, step back and think about it just a minute. The, no the number one cause of death is cardiovascular disease, but even that is only a third of deaths. So even though something may have a very significant impact on cardiovascular death, it's got to have three times that impact in order to have make a difference in overall death rate. So that's a really, it, it's a simple concept. You want to assume that, well, you know what, if it doesn't overall decrease death rate, why take it? There's a problem there in terms of that assumption because <clears throat> of what I just said. It can have a significant decrease in, in that disease, but it's still got to have at least three times that to, to make the cut point for significance for overall death. And part of the conclusions of this article was that um, many people with kidney disease, and many people with kidney disease, even those who were filtrating only at twenty percent of their capacity, and platelet-flocin uh, showed a lower risk of progression for kidney disease uh, than placebo. And we were talking about big pharma, so Boring, Ingelheim are the ones who are sponsoring this. Of course, it's it's their drug. Uh, but I mean, the evidence is still, I, I think it's a, it's a strong article. It's the evidence is well supported and it's not also saying, Hey, every people, every person with diabetes should be on this drug, but it opens a door for an option for those folks who already have kidney disease and who want to avoid dialysis. It really does. You know, number one, I've never heard that pronunciation for Beringer Ingelheim, but I think it's maybe a pretty good one. Boring Ingelheim. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they call it. And, <laughs> um, the, uh, you know, <clears throat> if we've said it once, we've said it, what, a thousand times or many thousands of times that uh, you cannot medicate your way out of a lifestyle issue. Lifestyle is clearly more important. We covered a couple of drugs today, but um, there is a place for drugs. There's a place for prescriptions. And as Jesus mentioned, you know, there are people that already have significant uh, kidney damage and already have significant di other types of diabetic damage. There are people that are managing their lifestyle and still continuing to have challenges and significant risk associated with cardiovascular disease and uh, their diabetes. Those are the people. And if you're watching and you're not there yet, you may get there one day. So um, 
think about it. Uh, don't ignore it entirely. So that gets that gets us to the end, doesn't it? Okay, so if you'll give us the transition, uh, Rafi, we will go into the Q&A for today. So uh, Jesus was, is going to be looking down the list to see some of the others. Um, somebody made a comment last week and said, you know, Box, what happens is you get you get so many questions sometimes you don't have uh, you don't get to the ones at the end. That's true. Uh, I think today we'll probably have time, but uh, we started doing some of that. For example, the first question had to do with empagliflozin and hypoglycemia, and we've already covered that. Uh, let's look to see. Good morning, Robert Weiss from the North Georgia mountains. HIIT, how do you define HIIT? So we did a, uh, I did a couple of, uh, points on that. Most technical definitions for high intensity interval training say, quote, at least 80% of one's maximum heart rate. That's where judgment comes in. If you say, you know, I'm 65. So if you say, I'm, uh, you take, you define it by saying 220 minus 65. So for me, that would be 155. Well, uh, I do mine, my high, my high intensity intervals on a uh, treadmill, and I can get up to like 10 miles per hour. And on a treadmill, you know, especially at our age, that starts to get pretty fast. So that still doesn't get me to 155. I have to go ahead and add um, some incline to get there. Hey, Seuss, are you doing HIT training? No, not right now. Uh, right now, I'm mostly doing um, how do you call it weights? So I'm I'm restarting Resistance. weights, uh, and and I, I I just had a I, I think you have shared this before. I I just I used to play soccer as a goalkeeper, and I just had an injury. A few weeks back, so trying to get back on track just with that. But I'm not doing hit right now. So used to is the operative word right now. So what was that? About a month ago, you were you were the goalie for your local uh, soccer club, and uh, yeah, sprained that ankle, huh? I was just getting back <laughs> after a few months not playing soccer anymore, and three three games ahead, and just had a an, an ugly ankle sprain. So that's. <laughs> What kind of resistance training are you doing? Um, well, mostly push-ups and how do you call them? Burpees? Burpees. Those, those are, there you are go. The Burpees are, are, a, are a known form of uh, high-intensity interval training. Yep. So back to medications, D. Dutton. So patabastatin. If a patient has CKD3, that's... Uh, chronic kidney disease level three, does the prescriber need to reduce the dose in half? You know, I am not familiar with that. Uh, Jesus, I can look that up, Jesus, while you take on the next question. Sure. So Rick Folia, thoughts on insulinopenic low carb. I, I think, I believe he's meant, he meant slow carb diet. Taking metformin to lower blood sugar uh, above 108, 108, even if A1C is 4.9 and fasting insulin is 3.9. So what I will say about metformin is even though when we're dealing with treating diabetes and we want to focus on keeping low levels of blood glucose, especially after meals, um, metformin is not known to have that huge amount of decrease on blood glucose. There is a risk of low, low glucose levels after taking metformin, but it's, it's not that as huge with, as it is with another drug. So even if you're on low carb, metformin can provide a huge benefits, especially if you are overweight or you have a few pounds that you want to decrease. Metformin can help with that. And also metformin has a huge impact on insulin sensitivity. So it helps a lot. There's this, it's one of a kind medication. There are other options for people who are intolerant, intolerant to metformin, especially due to 
gastrointestinal issues such as diarrhea or uh, bloated abdomen or, or all those gases that can come with taking metformin in some folks. And there's an option which is berberine as a supplement that you can try. But I don't be, I wouldn't be too worried about low levels, uh, extremely low levels of uh, blood sugar when taking metformin. And I won't take metformin to decrease uh, blood glucose levels just, just for that. There are other benefits when it comes to metformin. And there I was am also... Not... Go ahead. Go ahead. I, 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 was, was, I wanted to mention, there, for years, people were afraid of metformin because they said that it could cause lactic acidosis, which has been debunked already. I will tell you, the question about patavastatin and kidney failure is a deep one. We're going to need to take that one offline. Um, it gets into this whole discussion about the use of statins with kidney failure. Does it help in terms of uh, cardiovascular disease? Most things, most research it would indicate yes, but does it also help in terms of um, kidney failure? And that's a big debate. There's a lot of, uh, of inflama uh, information, uh, evidence on both sides of that debate. Uh, Robert Weiss, back to his question about how to tell whether or not he was uh, doing an effective HIT training. I use an Apple Watch. It's close enough. Yep. You know, as, as I mentioned, I uh, provided a little bit more detail on the HIT training and practical aspects of it a few minutes ago uh, and it provided a little bit more in writing than, than we discussed. One of the items is how do you know what your heart rate is? And um, I usually use this, this visual in terms of how hard I'm breathing because there's not really a good a good way of measuring heart rate when you're up at that level of exertion. Um, I used, I used to be a, a long distance runner and many times I've invested in different types of heart rate monitors. Some worked and were reliable for HIIT training, but very, didn't work very long. Uh, for example, one of them had the chest strap and it's hard to keep that chest strap to where it's tight enough and it's working effectively. Um, I'm currently using an Apple watch as Robert Weiss said, and yeah, it helps somewhat, but you start to have, you have to develop a feel of how you are. One of the things, a key component that I'll, I'll give you is during, uh, running aerobic running, people will say, oh, you need to be able to talk to a friend or you need to be able to hum. Not with high intensity intervals, with high intensity intervals, you're doing this, <laughs> You just cannot talk or anything. You're just gasping for breath. d I, 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 If I can add one thing I, I do, and maybe it's because I have access to it and I have used it before, but with COVID, uh, it got popular, the use of pulse oximeters. So they're not exact, but you can also, after the effort, you just put the pulse oximeter on your finger and it can give you a a notion of how many how many oxygen oxygen do you have and how, how what's your heart rate yep so there are these and i, I would recommend just doing those the, the simpler methods like that and uh, get a good idea you start to understand even on the treadmill most treadmills now have a little uh, a thing you can clamp your fingers down on uh, the problem with those is you can't really clamp your fingers while you're running that hard so you have to estimate based on uh, your cooling down and your heart rate slowing down and where exactly. you think it, it would have been. So D. Dutton's asking why empagliflozin is superior to generic dapagliflozin. I, I would answer a question with a question. Who said it was? Uh, we didn't. Um, and I'm not convinced that it is. Um, you know, there's some major competitors in that space. Each of them has their characteristics. Empagliflozin was one of the first ones uh, out, out there to get researched. And that is a major you know, advantage, you know, first arrival to a market space. I think that's Empagliflozin's 
probable major advantage, just that it was first. Uh, Ricky the Gun One. Good morning from North Carolina. I, 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 for, for, for the previous question, real quick, two comments that I want to say. Um, there, there are a couple of studies where they compared them, mm -hmm. and they're basically the same. And Pagliflozin did show a little more uh, better effect on decreasing A1C. Slightly better than that, that Pagliflozin. And what we mentioned today on the on the large on the large uh, topic was that that Pagliflozin has been studied on people with chronic kidney disease when they have a thirty percent uh, level of functioning, so to say. And in Pagliflozin has now been studied on folks with twenty percent. So. It's just the small details. Overall, I think I, I am of the same opinion that they are basically as good as each other. Just a bugly flow thing has a couple of studies backing up a few technicalities or better improvements on some specific spaces. I'm impressed that you remember that level of detail. Uh, yes, again, you'll see those competitors in that space and you'll see them fighting for... Um, uh, for that front line, you know, just like folk uh, sprinters in a in a sprint. Ricky the Gun from North Carolina. I know this is a basic question, but what are your tips to drop about ten to fifteen pounds? Hey, Seuss. Uh, maybe it's not the advice for Ricky the Gun because I, I I'm I'm pretty sure that most of our viewers are already doing a lot of huge work on uh, lifestyle components. But what I have seen that it works with my patients in Mexico, maybe it's because of the culture, but when they stop drinking soda, that helps a lot. That alone helps a lot. Just cutting carbs. And then it comes the exercise and building muscle. And then comes supplements and medications. I can tell you, I have, uh, it, it's a, it's, it, some of this, doctors finish their their um, core training and get started with patients, and they tend to just all get, you go through a very, very difficult time getting demotivated and running into what we call reality, because you learn so many things that are so lifestyle oriented, and you get out of that core training, the classroom training. And you're going to just save the world. But then you run into patients and you see how hard it is to get patients to change lifestyle. And it's because lifestyle changes are not easy. It's, you, it's not something if it were easy to maintain a healthy weight, everybody would be doing it. Now, one of the things that really uh was a shot in the arm for me was when I started taking patients from the channel. I have more patients that come to us from the channel that have lost 25, 35, 150 pounds and more. So it's a big deal. And it's a lot of fun to see these kind of patients because they are doing huge work. Now, one thing I can tell you <clears throat> When I, when I see those patients, what, what sort of history do they bring in? Almost all of them say, yep, the first thing I did was I dropped carbs. And when I dropped my carbs, my, I quit getting so hungry. You know, you get this blood sugar thing when you're eating a lot of carbs. Your blood sugar does this roller coaster. And when your blood sugar goes down after having been relatively high, you get hungry. So that's a big deal just in and of itself. The most common second step is to start some kind of intermittent fasting or time restricted eating. For most of us, you know, technically the scientists, the Walter Longos of the world will say it, the best meal to skip is dinner, supper, you know, the last meal of the day, because it gets your metabolism into a much better autophagy driven space, but that's not what most people do. And that's, I think for several reasons. Number one, it's, it's easier to skip a breakfast than it is uh, dinner for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's um, you just woke up and your metabolism is on, on a level ground since you've been sleeping. And I think the other thing is a social issue. Breakfast is not so much of a social event 
But around the world, dinner is much more of a social event, that last meal of the day. People have gone out, they've done whatever they're going to be doing in terms of work or other activities. And the family often meets or friends will meet for dinner in the evening. So the two things that I hear most often, Ricky, and appreciate you asking the question because it helps us you know, go into a very, very important area. There is nothing, as we said, you cannot outrun a lifestyle. You can't outrun a diet. You can't outprescribe a diet. Having healthy weight is the most important thing in terms of all of this. It's if you could, if Big Pharma could, uh, could charge and make it a pill, having the appropriate weight, they would make gazillions. And sure enough, you know, that brings up the whole discussion about glip ones, but I'm not going to go there right now. Uh, the first two things, number one, drop the carbs to stabilize your hunger. Number two, um, drop a meal a day. And then number three, start thinking about dropping more than one meal. You'll see in our next question that Robert Pinsky's bringing up the point of OMAD, one meal a day. And maybe nomad. If you eat one meal a day, they call it OMAD. What do you call it if you eat a meal in a different location each day? <laughs> nomad. Well, <laughs> I guess it's a good point. One of the third things that I'll bring up to patients when they come in and they've lost weight and they'll say, you know, doc, I, I'm wondering what else I can do. One of the things that you can do is extended fasting, fasting for more than 24 hours. Uh, the science behind that, the evidence behind that is just in, incontrovertible. You can't argue with it. It's a very, very uh, healthy thing to do. If you go back to the different uh, great religions of the earth uh, or, or of mankind, um, Jesus, the Jewish religions, um, uh Tao, Confucianism, all of them agreed on one thing, and that was fasting. Pushing away from the table. Even, Jay, even, the, Catholic, even, even the Catholics, we do have a, a version of that. And uh, they kind of changed it through history just to skip eating meat. Yeah. Which, 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 which I don't think it's, it's exactly the best option, though, but there's a version of that, of just decreasing the amount of food that you're eating. Well, speaking of which, isn't today the first day of Ramadan? That's right. And there's fasting associated with Ramadan. I, I think it's around two months of fasting for them. Yeah. Now, it's not a total... Uh, it, it's it's not a full day fast for most of them. I think it's uh, eat before sunrise and after sunset. Yeah. But... Uh, again, all the great religions, there's something there. Fast. Yeah, and I, I think it starts tomorrow. But, well, I mean, today or tomorrow, yeah. So, JMK2921, if the only cholesterol found in, in coronary plaque is free cholesterol, how can LDL be indicated for causing coronary artery disease? Since LDL on the care of Harry's cholesterol esters. Well, I didn't know that that was the case. You know, your condition, JMK, was the case. I thought that you found a significant amount of uh, small dents LDL in plaque. I see you nodding your head, Jesus. You're nodding your head in agreement with with the free cholesterol or the small dents LDL. No. Or something. I mean. We, we've, we've, we've discussed in the past what's the role of LDL on plaque, right? And uh, there's one, one version of LDL, which is oxidized LDL. And oxidized LDL does play a key role, and there, there are some esters involved in that. So I agree with, that the LDL might carry cholesterol esters, but it's, there, there's more to that. The, the process is more complex than it seems. But one thing that they, they, uh, the research agrees on is that there, if there's no inflammation, the level of oxidized LDL is not going to be that high. And I mean, it, there, there are different versions of cholesterol that can go through that membrane. And we covered that with the transitosis uh, mechanism of building plaque within the arterial wall. And all of that goes back to inflammation. So 
if LDL is carrying cholesterol esters, that doesn't mean that it cannot go through that membrane. Very, very good point. Nothing. I've got nothing to add to that. Uh, did, I was taking a look at this next question. De Dennis Williams is giving an advertisement for Mike Mutzel and Robert Schwelt. Or Schwelt. Um, <clears throat> he's talking about vitamin D. He's saying, very good morning. Shorten my early morning sunrise exposure for my time zone. Following Mike Mutzel for, early, for nearly eight years. 15 months ago, Dr. Schwelt confirmed that advice. And I've seen his stuff. And I've seen this one as well. It was... A very popular video. Light is medicine. Vitamin D is not enough on MedCram channel. I would say this. I don't think light is enough. Uh, I have seen multiple. You know, I do this also for a living and I see it time and time again where the husband, you, you know, you, you get a, a couple that live uh, that are in retirement. The husband is out golfing four hours of sun exposure a day. The wife is indoors. She's got a better vitamin D level than the husband. So um, supplementation may not be enough. Uh, I will also say light is not enough either. John Tocho, good morning. Remember to hit those thumbs up buttons. Thank you so much, John, for the reminder. I'd forgotten all about that. And if you'll do that, um, Rafi, if you'll show them where the, uh, where the thumbs up uh, button is, we'd appreciate it. And here's another thing. If you'll, if you'll take this content and put it on your uh, social media, your Twitter, your uh, LinkedIn, your Facebook, then what that does is it draws eyeballs uh, and the AI, the artificial intelligence, uh, looks at that and says, hmm, that uh, content has helped us compete with our uh, competitors. So they, uh, they boost that content quite a bit. Thank you again, John. So, Dennis Williamson again. Four years ago, I witnessed my father improve his GFR, his kidney function, by more than 25% from 38 to 74. That's very significant. When you're watching people with their filtration rate, it does tend to bob up and down, but that's significant. I had been feeding him green salads. My GFR also improved from 85 to 96. I tell you what, improvement of uh, weight usually helps any of the things that we're talking about in terms of lifestyle. And there's, and there's one thing that we should address. You should expect your kidney function to decrease with age. That's yes. just a normal process. There, there's no way around that. I, I haven't seen somebody on his 70s, 80s with a kidney function of over 100. That's not usual. But if you're keeping that above 70, 80, that's actually really good. It really is. It really is. So Dennis Williamson hit the like button. He said, thank you for the reminder. I appreciate that as well. Thank you so much, Dennis. Now, JMK is back to Empagliflozin. Would you recommend it for a type 2 diabetic taking already taking actose and insulin with a hemoglobin A1C of 6.5 and filtration rate of 70 and albumin of, over creatinine of less than 1? I have to tell you, uh, I am, I always hated insulin. Exogenous insulin is an inflammatory medicine. And there is absolutely no question in my mind that the new, uh, the new medications are far better. Either the SGLT2s or the GLP1s. Um, both of them have far less risk in terms of immediate risk with things like hypoglycemia. Both of them significant uh, instead of the weight gain and the fat uh, deposition that you see with uh, insulin where you inject the in insulin, you can actually get weight loss with both groups. So um, d uh, again, decreased cardiovascular inflammation, uh, Hands down, I just, I have always hated insulin. I, you know, some people have needed it. And um, JMK, I really appreciate you asking that question. It gives me a chance to go into what I consider to be a very, very important topic. And if you're a big fan of your insulin and you feel like you're stable on it and you didn't like hear, hearing what I had to say, I'm sorry. 
but you asked. Now, one other thing I would say is I'm glad to see somebody else taking Actos. It's called pioglitazone. And pioglitazone is a great medication. I just put somebody on pio yesterday. It was a patient that was having significant problems uh, uh, associated with diarrhea, kept trying to take, um, um, oh, I'm, I'm metformin. And uh, it's hard for me to get people to take, uh, to take pio these days, uh, popular diabetes-related medication, until it was found uh, to be associated with bladder cancer. And it was, all you have to do is say the C word and everybody runs for the hills. Well, you know, it's just, it's tragic because the number of lives that were lost, that were being saved with Actos, and then uh, were lost as people um, ran in fear of the side effects. It's just totally dwarfed the, the research signal that we saw with, uh, with bladder cancer. So I applaud you for making a tough decision, but a good one in terms of Actos. Um, and again, you might not have liked what I had to say about insulin, but it is what it is. You ask and I, I appreciate it. I have to comment on there. Uh, a couple of years back, I saw an article that mentioned that diet, co diet cola was associated with bladder cancer. Mm. And, I don't see, I, and I don't see many people stopping their colas. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, other, the other thing is... Uh, Very good I, point, I, by the way. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if um, uh, this is something that happens in the U.S., but in, in Mexico, I have a lot of patients that... It, it, on, on my beginning years as well, when I used to prescribe insulin because that's what I was taught at, at, at that time. And uh, uh, they mentioned that insulin would get them blind. That's why they didn't take insulin. And at the moment I was like, well, diabetes leaves you blind and people need to know that. But now I think, well, insulin might provide some insulin resistance and increase your body weight and give you on the cycle of eating carbs. So they, are, they may be right then <laughs> at the end of the day. So uh, just wanted to point that out. It's a really good point. Both of them, very, very good points. Anything else about, uh, about that before we move on? No, I mean, uh, I do have a couple of patients who are on, on, on insulin, and I can tell you that it's hard to get them out of it, because, especially if they are at really high doses. Uh, there, there's one insulin which is called glargin, glargin insulin. Glargin, yeah, different. yeah. And I have a patient that is with a dosage of uh, 50 units every day. That's what they're yeah, describing. And and but they don't change their way of eating. So if they yeah. stop taking the insulin, their blood glucose goes to 400, 500. Those are hard cases because they have to understand what's going on. And if they are, have obesity, it's, it's a really complex situation, which requires even some mental health support to help them understand why they have to do it. A lot of these people are depressed. High, blood, high levels of blood glucose leads to depression as well. So it's just a Absolutely. cycle which, and it's hard to get out of it. It's a vicious, vicious cycle. So you, you get started on the carbs, you... Um, you get obese, the carbs, the daily carbs and the obesity require more and more insulin. Once you get going with the insulin, you got to take the carbs or you're, the insulin's going to make you go hypoglycemic. In order to make any of those lifestyle changes, you need to be able to amass some energy uh, from a psychological perspective and you're already into depression from that that diabetic spiral and it is a mess it is very very difficult to budge people off of that space thank you for bringing that up um <clears throat> a quick comment about uh, fort worth says good show as always uh, D. Dutton is back into, so but D. Dutton says, in the intro, you started to talk about the Flozens, the Flozens and Barrow Sensing. More discussion, please. Well, <clears throat> I did bring up Barrow Sensing, but 
I did not bring up barosensing specific to the glyphosins. I don't think we the either the articles that we covered mentioned that today. What I was talking about with barosensing had to do with uh, an article that Jesus covered a couple of weeks ago. It's this article where uh, we think that uh, there is no sign of kidney disease, even though we know the patient has significant ongoing uh, years and years worth of prediabetes and or diabetes. And the cautionary tale to remember that that GFR might not be as good as you think because of barrow sensing. One of the one of the first things that happens is as you start to get that early diabetes injury to the kidney, the barrow sensing steps in and says, "Wait a minute, you're starting to drop your GFR, so let's increase the pressure." To me, uh, we I'm going to switch over for a second, and you'll see why. I'm going to switch over and talk about blood pressure for a second. Most of us think that, well, the vast majority of blood pressure is what we call uh, essential hypertension or idiopathic, and we don't know what the cause is. In my mind, I think the vast majority of it is exactly what we're talking about here. Some early um, AGE, advanced glycation end product, uh, damage to the, um, to the kidney, to the um, uh uh, to the filtration mechanisms in the kidney and to the barrow sensing. So the barrow sensing sees that they push that blood pressure up and they increase the uh, kidney function. So that's what we were talking about, D. Dutton. Hey, Seuss, I jumped on a bunch of different areas. I'm not sure that I made the correct, the, I'm not sure that I made the connections as obvious as they need to be. Uh, any comments or, or improvements on that? The way that we usually measure GFR of our glomerular filtration rate is with creatinine. So we use a couple of formulas to do that. And it's not unusual to see a person with, uh, with, with, with important insulin resistance who have a creatinine of below 0 0.5, 0 0.5, which might look normal. And you calculate the, the GFR and it comes to 110, 150, and they think they're okay, but it's just that that red flag that says, hey, your kidneys are over-functioning right now, and your OGTT shows that. That's why it's important to complement all the studies, because if you only see a glucose of 95 and a, and a filtration rate of 100, most physicians, physicians will think, oh, you're okay, let's see you next year. And you see them next year, and then blood glucose is 110, and the GFR is starting to decrease, but it's within normal levels yet. So then you skip to another year and you just get on that roller coaster until it's too late. Very, very helpful. I will make a comment. Uh, tired looking for name gave us a $10 super chat. If you'll uh, show, well, you are showing exactly how to do that, Rafi. Thank you so much in the upper right hand corner. And uh, this makes a difference. Again, there's uh, people all over the world that are taking this content and learning how to protect their health. And these contributions, these super chats help a lot in terms of helping us get there. I basically support the channel with, the, um, with my savings and with money that I make from seeing patients. And um, any little bit helps. So Bobby Acampo asked the same question again that he asked before the show. Is there a risk of hypoglycemia if you take empagliflozin in a fasted state? As I said earlier, there is very, very little risk. This is not like insulin. The, the two, both of the, the two drug categories, um, the GLP-1s and especially the SGLT2s, very little, if any, risk. But if you're trying to get me to say there is no risk, I'll never say that. Um, but just look at the mechanism, especially for SGLT2s. That's what I was talking about earlier on, Bobby. They don't uh, make the blood sugar go down. What they do is they drain off blood sugar and keep the kidney from putting sugar back into the blood after it's been filtered. So no, that's not a, that's a, 
hypoglycemia is not a thing that you see with it. So Dennis says, oh, ho hold on. Go ahead. One thing, uh, and we didn't mention yet this, and I think we have mentioned this in the past. One thing you should be careful of is urinary tract infections. Because yes. since, since you're dropping all that blood glucose through the urine, you're not reabsorbing that into your system. It's going to go into the urine and bacteria love glucose as well. So uh, you just got to be really careful, especially if you are on um, on a wheelchair or it's hard for you to move around. Uh, it can put you on a higher risk of urinary tract infection. So just be aware of that. Thank you so much. And someone a little bit later said, um, brought up a good point. Empagliflozin is used for heart failure. And it is. It's a very good medication now. I think, didn't we cover that just a couple of months ago, Jesus? Use of Probably. Probably. And, and it has to do, and it has to do, we, would you mention the, the uh, co-transported sodium glucose? Mm -hmm. So you are dropping glucose and you are dropping sodium. And yes. sodium is well known to be related to high blood pressure, and that's 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 why that's that's why it helps with heart disease, heart insufficiency. So um, Dennis says, "Good morning, Bobby." Desitistery, Doc Brewer, and Jesus. Either of you have any suggestions on slowing tinnitus? Thanks, Millard. Like Willard, thank you so much, Millard. Uh, as I had asked a couple of times, I was trying to figure out how to pronounce that name. So I think we'll uh, keep reminding me, uh, Millard. And my answer would be <clears throat> beyond the obvious, no. And what what's obvious? Obvious is keeping your, um, you know, two things. Number one, believe it or not, it is associated with prediabetes and diabetes. And if you don't know that, uh, Google it and you'll see see some of that. So the other thing, though, I think is not so, well, I would hope it would be obvious, and that is loud noise. You know, Jesus and I have both worked in occupational settings, and uh, anytime you start getting over 90 decibels, especially in the, uh, in the two, three, and 4,000 hertz uh, areas, that's when you start getting damage, and you, you'll walk out of that and, getting, and get uh, ringing of your ears. So either of those things, uh, Keep, you know, it's again, lifestyle and prevention is critical. The third item I'll mention is, you know, if you're in a space where there's noise, like your work operating machinery, like a lawnmower, uh, you may think it's goofy looking, but it's not. Wear, wear hearing protection. So, I, 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 yeah, I have a couple of points on there because uh, I had the fortune to to spend a couple of times studying tinnitus as part of my residency program. And one thing it's important for, for all of you to know is that the the structure, the nervous nervous structure on the ear, it's just like most of neurons in the brain. If if you lose them, they, there are a couple of like, I don't know how you call them, like ciliums, but I don't know what how you yeah, call hair, them. like a hair cell. Hair cells. So those are really important to, to convert noise into a nervous system si signaling on the brain. And if you lose those, you lost them forever. So first step will be preventing, preventing through taking care of your metabolism and be aware of low, no, low, loud noises and take care of that. But when you develop tinnitus, there are a couple of studies that could be helpful, such an audiometry or acuphonometry, which are done to measure how your ear is doing. And severe cases where the ear is already damaged might require other therapies, such as even psychological therapy, just to get used to that noise and manage that because a lot of cases have no, have no way around it and there's no comeback. So there's no better way to prevent that than avoiding it in the first place. You know, I have to tell you, I had gotten to a point to, I've got significant tinnitus uh, and uh, I had gotten to a point to where I was not hearing it on a regular basis and significant improvement. It was interesting. I went to a friend's house and he had turned, he was a audiophile. He had played in a band for many, many years and he wanted to show me some of his different music. I did not think that that was loud enough to cause a problem. 
I walked out of there with it ringing in my ears and I've had it again. And that was almost a year ago. So be very, very careful about noise. If you use headsets as well, there are people who mm -hmm. use one ear headsets and they have been shown to have a specific damage due to that. Even if the volume, it doesn't seem too loud. Be very careful. Uh, Dennis says, good morning, Millard. Uh, Bobby Ocampo, best to lose weight is prolonged fasting. Prolonged fasting is hard for people to wrap their head around, but it's really good for you. Desitivity, Millard, uh, radio frequent, or Millard, uh, radio celebrity, Ian Punnett has tinnitus. Last I heard, he tried the ketogenic lifestyle and no longer complains about his tinnitus. You could ask him. So, yes, I'm, I'm sure that that helps because, um, again, of the association with, um, with diabetes and prediabetes. Lent, anybody. Now, why would Dennis be bringing up Lent? I think he might be bringing it up in terms of what you give up for Lent. Maybe you give up food for a, a few weeks, do a 30-day fast. Keto Man brings up a really good point. I am so glad you mentioned it, Keto Man. We keep talking about empagliflozin. We have not yet once used the term. It's uh, The brand name is Jardians. Leo Acapulco, good morning. What do you recommend to improve kidney function? Thank you for the great information. Uh, good morning, by the way, Leo and Jesus. Uh, you want to take that one? Well, I think it's what the whole show has been about. Uh, it's lifestyle. It's knowing what you are dealing with in terms of insulin resistance, which is the main cause of kidney disease. And if you're working through that, I, I will say that's the way to go. Exercise, diet. And of course, some cases have a specific damage to the kidney due to other diseases. It's not the highest percentage. But if you're not improving, maybe take a look at that because uh, there are some cases where there are other issues that might be involved with poor kidney function. I'm going to go to this next one because it caught my eye. Keto Man says, I hope you'll authorize Medicare Original. I will be your patient. That's exactly what we're doing, Keto Man. In fact, it's going to be longer for those that are in Medicare Advantage. Uh, we are already seeing some um, straight or... Um, traditional, or as you put, Medicare original. We're doing that. And if you'd like to see us, um, uh, Rafi, if you'll put up the, the number and the email address for, uh, for talking to Michelle or the folks in the office and Keto Man can get registered with us. Dennis, Mike Mitzel, your channel, YouTube channel is High Intensity Interval Health, author of Belly Effect. He trains doctors and their staff. Old Lang Syne, empagliflozin used in heart, yeah, as we mentioned. As I mentioned before, Tired Looking for Name gave us a super chat. Very, thank you very much, uh, Tired. Desitivity gave us a super chat. Thank you so much, Desitivity. Ten bucks to help us uh, pay for... Uh, Pay for Rafi, pay uh, uh, pay salaries for Jesus and the other folks that are doing such good work for us. And Rafi's showing how to do it if you'd be interested in, in helping us out. Dennis Williamson, eat salt, eat real. D. Dutton, Jesus, or Jesus is a great teacher. I, you know, I didn't, at first I thought she was talking about the other Jesus. I, I think she's talking about the other one. <laughs> uh, I think she might be referring. Uh, D. Dutton, tell us if you're talking about Dr. Jesus here. I think many people would agree with uh, either one of those comments. Either one of those interpretations. K. King, I've watched my ringing in the ears to the solar wind speed. When it goes to 450, 550 is when mine is so bad. When is when the speed goes down, so does the ringing. Well, that is interesting. Had you heard that before? Yes, uh, it's a Ooh. phenomenon. That, it's a phenomenon that is called recruitment, and it's it's interesting that it's happening with that specific case. But people who start to develop uh, ear damage, they start uh, hearing more loud noises, but understanding less. And when you increase the volume, they are able to understand a little bit better. But there is a space on that range of, of 
audio volume where they lost all signaling. And that's mm. just because the the ear is adapting to those new changes. So it's it's a sign of, of ear damage. Very interesting. One of my first exposures to it was when I, my first occupational medicine job, I went into a, I went into a company called Bethlehem Steel. And, uh, you know, there were so many guys that had uh, trip level uh, noise exposure as a steel mill. And so there were like there were about 10,000 people at the plant and there were about 3,500 that were uh, getting it done. It was so interesting. I kept looking for, well, where, uh, where were the, there was a thing called a threshold shift. In other words, you had to get a higher level of, of noise or, or input in order for the person to hear it. That's what Jesus was talking about a minute ago. And it was, it was like, uh, <clears throat> so I started looking around. I was the new medical director. What one of the folks told me is, oh, yeah, we've got these. He, he pulled out a stack of um, hearing measurements. And I said, OK, go over your process. He said, well, the trucks go around. They do all the testing. The numbers come in here. We look at them and then we file them. And I said, but wait a minute. <laughs> Where's the analysis? Where's the standard threshold shifts? And he said, what? So no wonder they had no standard threshold shifts for years. It was like, oh, you go through all of that work and just a process problem, just major impact on people. So JMK, yes, Jardiance is a very expensive. Both of these new drug classes, the uh, SGLT2s and the... Um, uh, the glip ones are very expensive and, you know, big pharma is going to take its pound of flesh until, until there's so much competition that, um, that the competition ratchets that, um, that number down. And guess what? That's going to have impact on lives. There are going to be people that who, many lives that could be saved if these, uh, if these dollars were, if, if these were at a more reasonable cost. Lynn Carlton, where are you located? I'm lo I'm located right now in South Carolina. Jesus is located near, is it Guana Guanajuato? I used to live in Guanajuato, but I now I live on my home state, which is called Querétaro. Uh, but uh, Lynn, if you're, if you're interested, uh, the vast majority of patients that I'm, I've been seeing for, for years now is, um, telemedicine. And if, you know, I used to, I used, to, one of my major goals was to provide better access through telemedicine. People really didn't get it and they didn't like it. You know, they just did not, it, it wasn't that they didn't like it. Once they tried it, it was great, but nobody could wrap their he head around seeing their doctor over, over, you know, remotely until the pandemic happened. And things have changed. Uh, Doc, if I, and I, if I can add something, and this is related to, I believe uh, it was GMK comment about the price of Guardians. Uh, if you have heard of San Miguel de Allende before, right? Now that we're talking about Guanajuato. Mixing topics a bit, but it, it has a purpose. San Miguel Allende. Was he in, uh, was he in, um, that wasn't, um, uh, was he a political leader? No, 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 no. Uh, he's he was a, a, a saint. Oh, you're, okay. you're confusing him with an, with another uh, Miguel Allende, which was a, a yeah. revolutionary independence independence leader in Mexico. Well, San Miguel Allende is a small town, but there are a lot of expats living there, and, ah. and just 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 to 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 provide a, a, a picture of what it's like to live in Mexico, other than what you see on the news, violence and all of that. That's, that's a topic for another type of channel. But if you, if you come to live to Mexico, Guardians is like $88. Mm, uh, I thought that may be where that's going. 
you know so again in america we have this is a big big deal and that's why you know for example um some of the higher end statins like somebody mentioned patavastatin a few minutes ago uh patavastatin is still prohibitively expensive in the u.s but you can get it uh, through uh, uh online pharmacy uh in, in canada uh, for like Harley, a dollar Harley's a day. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think I was thinking about, uh, didn't they call him Fanta uh, Miguel Allende? <laughs> no, I, I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't heard that before. <laughs> didn't he have red hair? No, I don't think so. <laughs> no, I'm thinking of somebody else. I'm thinking of, <laughs> oh, well. Okay, so more where you located Desitivity. Medicare disadvantage. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny. I've never, I've been in Medicare Advantage for so many years, desitivity, but I haven't heard that term. Medicare disadvantages. It's easy to switch to original Medicare if I can get around the high cost of Eliquis. Uh, I, um, I don't know if and when you can switch back desitivity. You need to speak to a, uh, a, a Medicare broker to see if you can. Dennis Williams, I guess that means thank you or something. Uh, Day Dutton, Leo, when I switched to the whole plant food diet, my GFR went up 50%. I ate a whopping two pounds of <clears throat> non-starching vegetables and a pound of low fructose fruits. Believe me, I don't get hungry. Well, again, it's... You can't outrun or outprescribe a diet. And that's the last comment for the day. Any comments to wrap us up, Dr. Jesus? Yes, I do have one quick comment. Uh, on 2019, when lifestyle medicine was starting to born, or was a couple of years around, I, I, I remember a lecture that I mentioned. They were talking about the risks of a carnivore diet. But one thing that... I remember they said, if you eat salads, if you eat vegetables, you can eat almost as many as you want. And I think that's what D. Dutton is talking about right here. Yep. Very good point. I traveled for many years um, when I was at Toyota, when I was uh, before Toyota, after Toyota. One of my uh, most favorite momentous days was when I finally graduated out of uh, uh, Delta Platinum because I was flying so much. Um, and when you travel that much, you really have to be careful about diet. And one of the things, one of my rules was I could only have salads. And sometimes I could get like a piece of salmon with it. But if I ate something more than, if I started eating entrees, I would just start gaining weight yes. you can eat all the salad you want so i think that's a good thing to end up with thank you so much good okay. show